Francis Ford Coppola directed one of the most disturbing movies about the Vietnam War with a title that was straight out of the book of Revelation. Anybody know it? Apocalypse Now. The, uh, the movie portrayed this uh, war as kind of crazed mayhem in which objectives are confused and morality really impossible. And in one particular scene, an American officer arrives in the midst of a firefight and shells are exploding everywhere and machine gun tracers are filling the night sky and and soldiers look wide-eyed and desperate. And one officer pipes up and says, who's in charge? Nobody answers, which is Coppola's point in the film. Uh, It's a scene out of hell with no direction, no purpose, no solution. The book of Revelation presents exactly the opposite understanding of the chaos and barbarism of human history. We're going to see that today in the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, the four horsemen of the apocalypse are part of our cultural imagination, Uh, Most people probably don't know what it means or where it comes from, but they've heard the language. In fact, if you did a quick internet search, uh, you will find that the four horsemen are a bunch of different things. They're a band, a group of writers. It's a movie, a novel, a WWF wrestling team from the 1980s, a video game, a set of action figures, a toy company, a group of Washington insiders, and one site called... The Four Horsemen, the evil telecommunication companies of AT&T, Time Warner, Comcast, and Verizon. They were all once the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Now, before we get into chapter six and the Four Horsemen here, I want to recap what we have so we understand the context. One of the challenges of preaching through a book in any kind of detail is that you find yourself staring at the individual tree and have no idea what the forest looks like. I want to try to do that for us periodically so we know where we are. We can see the place from a, from a helicopter. Revelation 1 tells us this book is a prophecy and an apocalypse and a letter. It's all three things. It's a book that shows us things. In, in chapter 1, introduces us to the glorified, exalted Son of Man who is both velveted and heavy. He walks among the lampstands, that's the churches. That is, he knows Alliance Bible Church. He knows Alliance Bible Church. He sees everything and misses nothing. In chapters two and three, Jesus writes customized messages to seven churches in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, basically telling them, here's what you're good at, here's what you're not good at, repent of the things you're not good at, and the overarching command was Nike. Overcome, conquer, be victorious. And one of the ways that we overcome is to gaze upon him who sits on the throne. That's chapter four. God is presented in all his transcendent glory. The angels bow before him and cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He's surrounded by thunder and lightning and 28 heavenly beings, things that keep anyone approaching from getting too close to the throne. Around the throne is a vast expanse that appears as a sea of glass, all to distance God from John. God himself is not pictured. Only metaphors are used because God is indescribable. That scene 
serves as the setting for chapter five. In chapter five, we're told that the one who sits on the throne has in his right hand of power a scroll sealed with seven seals. The scroll is not the Lamb's book of life. Rather, it is nothing other than God's purposes for both judgment and salvation. This is the scroll that bears all of those purposes. And it's the slitting of the seals that enacts the document. So the drama in chapter five is who can approach this unapproachable God of transcendent glory who has in his right hand the scroll that holds all of God's purposes for judgment and salvation, who can approach this God and take that scroll in hand, slit the seals and bring to pass all of God's purposes? Who can do this? John waits breathlessly and agonizingly to see who's found worthy to do this, who can approach the throne. And no one's found. No one, and he weeps, and he weeps. It's as if all of God's plans and purposes are gonna be frustrated. There's no hope, there's no way out. Injustice is gonna prevail, sin is gonna triumph. It's a contradiction of all that John knows of God. And as he weeps, an interpreting elder touches his shoulder and says, stop crying, John, look, look. The lion of the tribe of Judah, he has conquered. And he's able to open the scroll. And John looks and he sees a slain lamb standing. Jesus is both the conquering and reigning lion and the sacrificial lamb. He's both. This lion and lamb approaches the throne and takes the scroll in hand and all of heaven erupts in a symphony of praise. Jesus, the lion and the lamb, slits the seals and what you have is the beginning of the enactment of the scroll which we have in the verses before us today. Now before we dive into chapter six, I need to provide you with some interpretive tools for understanding the rest of this book. And I'm gonna give you two of them. And I can pretty much guarantee that after you've heard these two, the book of Revelation will make a thousand percent more sense than it ever has in your life. Okay? First, <laughs> Revelation is repetitive, not linear. You can't go from chapter one all the way through to chapter 22 and make a huge timeline. It does not work like that. Revelation works in cycles. So the seven seals show us a picture from the first century to the end of the world from one angle, and then we back the truck up, and we do the same thing from a different angle with the trumpets. And then we back the truck up and we do the same thing again with the bowls, all from different angles, okay? Cyclical, repetitive, not linear. That will help you when you read this book. Let me give you an example. In chapter 11, in chapter 11, 22 chapters in Revelation, in chapter 11, there's a picture of final judgment. And then in chapter 20, there's another picture of final judgment. Not because there are two final judgments, but because Revelation is showing us the same thing from a different angle. Revelation 16, 17, the seventh bowl is poured out and the angel cries, it is done. And then in Revelation 21, 6, we read again, it is done. Did it get done twice? No, same thing, different angle. That's the first interpretive tool you need to have in your belt if you're gonna understand this book. Second, we need to realize Revelation is prophecy. And prophecy in Revelation functions much like prophecy in the Old Testament. And it allows for multiple fulfillment. We will not understand biblical prophecy anywhere in the book until we understand that there are multiple fulfillments to prophetic literature. There is a partial fulfillment and then often later a complete fulfillment. This is especially important when we look, like, look at a passage like this one. There have been lots of godly Christians um, 
in lots of centuries who thought the end of the world was nigh upon them because they saw the four horsemen. They, they thought, here it is. Here are the four horsemen. It's happening. There's war, there's scarcity, there's famine, there's plague. We must be at the end. And I'm sure all the Armageddon books are seeing an uptick in sales because of what we see happening around us today. So what do we make of this? When people say, see, there's war, there's scarcity, there's sickness. We must be at the end of the world. What do we make of that? Well, we've got two options. We could say, everyone could be wrong. We could say, everyone who has ever made or ever will dare to identify some current event with Revelation 6, we could say every single one of those have been wrong. And everyone will be wrong except that one lucky person who really is at the end of the world. But there's another option. Everyone could be right. Wherever we see famine, war, conquest, death, we see the four horsemen of Revelation. In other words, we must allow for multiple, or in this case, almost constant fulfillment of this prophecy. Listen carefully. The four horsemen of the apocalypse are not a one-time occurrence at the end of human history. Instead, they represent the execution of God's judgment and warning from the first century to this very day. Almost all the prophecies of Revelation have multiple fulfillments, and it's the same with Old Testament prophecies. Now, how do you know that? Well, let me give you just one example. Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. Prophetic literature. Yes? Isaiah's prophesying. What's he prophesying about? He's prophesying about the return of the exiles from Babylon. And he says, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight the, wi the wilderness a highway for God. What is Isaiah talking about? He's talk he's, people he's preaching to weren't even yet in Babylon. And he's saying to them, you're gonna be carried away, but the Lord is gonna come and he's gonna deliver you from exile. That's what the passage is about. But there was a further fulfillment, which is why John the Baptist announces Jesus' ministry with these very same words from Isaiah 40. So it's possible and it's common for biblical prophecy to have multiple fulfillment. Hopefully that will help make sense of the book for you. <clears throat> now let me give you the bottom line of the four horsemen of the apocalypse and then we'll work our way through the particulars. What we have in our passage before us today is military destruction, civil disorder, bloodshed, social and economic breakdown, and death. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> it's not a pretty picture. Let's take a closer look at this, and I'm not going to belabor my comments on this because no one wants their preacher to beat a dead horse. So let's take a look at this together. Revelation 6, get your Bibles open. Revelation 6. I watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, come. I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. So Jesus breaks the first seal of the scroll that was in the right hand of God. And this is what we have. Now, throughout the history of the church, there have been two interpretations of this white horse and its rider. Some immediately think of Revelation 19, which is a picture of Jesus, victorious, riding a white horse. I don't believe the first horseman of the apocalypse is Jesus for three reasons. First, this would make this horse so in incredibly unlike the other three. The second reason is that we have this repetitive command that these horsemen were given power and authority to do their various deeds. Jesus is not portrayed in the book of Revelation as one who needs that. He has it. And third, when you just look at the direct descriptions of this horseman with Jesus in Revelation 19, they are very different. The second way this white horse has been understood is symbolic of military conquest. Keep in mind, Rome was incredibly powerful at the time John writes this book. 
Domitian had organized Rome into an empire that was now systematically persecuting Christians rather than just haphazardly through parts here and there of the Roman Empire. This was a systematic organization of it. Roman generals, even emperors, often rode or at least pulled by white horses as a way of declaring conquest and victory. So I think this is a picture of, and many before us have thought this is a picture of men and women trampling on others, wreaking havoc in the name of greed, ambition, imperialism, plucked right out of first century cultural context wherein Rome was a rampaging beast. Now, as we go through this, you're, you might think of Jesus' words in his Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. There is remarkable similarity between this chapter and a couple of chapters that follow. Uh, between that and what Jesus teaches in Matthew 24, he said, in the last days there will be wars and rumors of wars. And he said, nation will rise against nation. That's what we have here in the white horse. Verse three, when the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. What's the difference between this and the red horse? Well, I think here we're given a convincing picture of vigilante war, civil unrest, civil war. First century readers of this may have thought of the struggles of the Roman Empire between 68 and 70 AD where there were four different emperors on the throne in that short span of time. That was unheard of throughout Rome's history. There was nearly constant civil strife and bloodshed, soldiers getting killed for no good reason, entire armies being wiped out, clans being massacred as people strove for power. Frankly, it doesn't sound all that much different from the Balkans or Rwanda. Now notice how this is phrased. The horse's rider is given power to take peace from the earth. It's almost as if our world could be a lot worse. The world could be a lot worse. When I read Romans 1, where God gives people over to ever-increasing wickedness, there's a sense that the worst thing God could do is let us act like ourselves. And he pulls back his hand, he says, okay, If you want to do your heart's desire, go for it. I really do wonder to what degree evil in the world is restrained because of the mighty hand of God. Book of Revelation is going to make a very convincing case that God is active in restraining the evil that resides within every human heart. We are far worse than we think we are. God keeps sinful humanity in check by laws and societal pressures, a whole web of cultural forces that make us better than we would be in a completely natural environment. Anybody ever read Lord of the Flies? That's what the book's about. Get a bunch of people on a paradise island, what happens? Well, they make a mess of the place. And we think it's the world that makes us bad. No, we're the ones that make the world bad. The world is bad because it's littered with sinners. And it's God's judgment on us when he lifts some of the divine restraint and he lets people act according to their true desires. We behave like animals. We slay each other. Verse five, when the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come. I looked and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, two pounds of wheat for a day's wages and six pounds of barley for a day's wages and do not damage the oil and the wine. 
So the rider rides out on this black horse carrying a pair of old-fashioned balances, right? Scales, you weigh one thing, balance it out. The picture here is economic breakdown. The prices delineated are 10 to 12 times their normal value. What is that? 20 bucks for a gallon of gas? How much is milk today? It tells you who does the shopping in our house. <laughs> Three bucks? 350? 370? Four? What is it? $37 for a gallon of milk? Supply and demand? When supply is low, demand is high, prices skyrocket? It's not necessarily famine, but scarcity. However, things are not as bad as they could be. Do not damage the oil and wine. They're leaving the olives and grapes alone. God is still restraining the full fury of his judgment. Why? We'll come to that momentarily. Verse seven, when the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come. I looked and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death. and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, plague, by the wild beasts of the earth. Fourth seal is a a pale horse, or green to be more specific, the color of sickness. Its rider is given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, plague, wild beasts. I don't think one quarter is literal, but stylized. Numbers are that way in the book of Revelation, as we'll see. The point is the fury of God's judgment is being restrained because as we progress through the judgments, one quarter becomes one third. There's a ratcheting up. So what do we have in this picture of the four horses? We've got warfare, we've got civil strife, economic breakdown, disease, death. Why? Well, the ultimate answer to the question is because the scroll which contains God's purposes for judgment and salvation and the slain lamb standing is enacting the document. Now, none of this means we shouldn't try to end wars or civil strife or scarcity or sickness. We ought to work to end those things. But it does mean that human beings will inevitably find ways of subjugating other human beings, of killing, of rampaging, of taking, of being cruel, of controlling. Inevitably, we'll find ways. There will be wars and rumors of wars. That's what Jesus Christ himself taught. Death from sword and famine and plague and nature is inescapable. Now, when you look at the imagery, you'll notice there is overlap among the four horses. They are not neatly divided up into compartmentalized functions. For example, the fourth horse wields a sword to inflict death. Well, the first two horses also inflict death. These are not four horses coming at separate periods of time. The idea is that these are the things that accompany the onset of God's purposes for judgment and blessing. They happen simultaneously. As the seals are slit, these kinds of things are the things that unfold. Thus, the first four seals reflect troubled times that foreshadow the coming consummation of the kingdom. Now there are seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. The reason I take the four seals together is because they are related. We've got four horsemen. We'll see with the fifth, sixth, and seventh seal. They're very different. Almost as if they're talking about maybe a slightly different time. These foreshadow the coming consummation of the kingdom. Now what does this mean for us? Let me give you four points of application first. Christians ought to refrain from making end of the world predictions. We just look silly. When we say the end is coming on September 6, 1994, 
And then when that doesn't happen, we revise it. We say, oh, I meant September 29th, 1994. Book sales spike and then plummet and the author looks silly and foolish. Avoid being chart Christians, please. I don't wanna see your end time chart. Don't come up to me afterwards and, and show me we're between the third and fourth seal. I don't wanna see a chart, no, no charts. Whenever Jesus was asked when concerning the coming, he refused to answer the question. Let me give you one example of that. Acts chapter one, verse seven. The disciples asked, they asked. Here's what he said. It's not for you to know. It's none of your business. It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. There have been Christians in every generation who have thought theirs would be the last. <laughs> and all of them were wrong. Second, the four horsemen are riding forth, will keep riding forth, and have been riding forth for 2,000 years. So you look on the news and you say, hey, look what's going on in the Middle East. Look what's going on in our own streets. God has unleashed the four horsemen in the world, and I would say to you, you are absolutely correct. Five years from now, something else is gonna happen. You're gonna say, hey, the four horsemen are loose, and I would say you're absolutely right. Now, there likely was an initial fulfillment of this. When John gets it in the mid-90s AD, likely an initial fulfillment of it. And there have been subsequent fulfillments of the prophecy since then. And there will be an intensification of fulfillment of this prophecy as history marches towards the true end. But in the meantime, God is continually judging us and warning us by wars and scarcity and sickness and death. See, the reason every generation of Christian thinks they're in the end times is because they are. <laughs> The end times, the last days, start at Pentecost. You can go read about it in Acts 2, Peter's sermon. He says it. We've been there since. Here's what Jesus says. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. But see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen. I wonder if his mind, he thought, because I'm slitting the seals. Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. The four horsemen, they've been riding forth for 2,000 years. Such things must happen through the beginning of birth pains. Mothers, you can ever so passionately and eloquently regale us of tales of the pain of childbirth. Mild, mild. In an attempt to describe what childbirth is like, my wife <laughs> once pulled a hair from my head and I said, ouch. She raised her voice and said, times a million. Okay. <laughs> the pain's intense. Jesus is saying Revelation 6 and all that follows are birth pains. They will be and are currently intense. But the pain of childbirth is different than the pain you experience from a broken leg. Why? Broken leg hurts because it's destructive pain. Childbirth pain is productive. 
It's moving somewhere. It's moving towards something glorious and beautiful and joy-filled. Look at the world and see it that way. Third, let every scene of conquest, every description of war and scarcity, every gruesome picture of death be a warning to us of greater judgment. Who's getting beat up by the horsemen? (laughs) The short answer is everybody. Everybody. Is it the wayward church? We shouldn't be shocked. We read about a bunch of it in Jesus' messages to the churches. Revelation 2.5, if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Revelation 2.16, repent therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them. Who's the them? Those in the church glomming on to false teaching. I'm gonna come fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Jesus' words, not mine. Revelation 2.20, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. Yeah. It's the wayward church. The horsemen are coming. So if you don't get your act together, I'm gonna come and judge you. Christ will come and he'll discipline unfaithful churches, unfaithful Christians. Is the judgment for the unbelieving world? Yes. God gives them small judgments to foretell a larger judgment to come. Is the judgment for the faithful church? We're gonna see in the fifth seal, martyrs who got swept up in the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Christians don't get a free pass. We don't get a free pass from the evils of the world. Now for us, it's not a judgment. It is a trial meant to sanctify and purify. God uses suffering in the life of the believer to wean our hearts off the pleasures of this world. Let me be very specific. Some people have been and will be infected with coronavirus as a specific judgment from God because of their sinful attitudes and actions. Now, I offer a disclaimer, we are not to render verdicts on others in regards to this. We can speak about it generally, we cannot speak about it specifically. If you don't believe me, go read the book of Job. I'll give you an example of this. Acts 12, Herod the king exalted himself by allowing himself to be called a god. Then what happened? Let's read about it. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down and he was eaten by worms and died. God can do that with those who exalt themselves, which means we should be amazed that more of our rulers do not drop dead every day because of their arrogance before God and humankind. God's restraint is a great mercy. Some Christians have been and will be infected with coronavirus as a way of calling us to repentance and getting us to realign our lives with the infinite worth of Christ. God uses suffering in the life of the believer to wean us off the pleasures of this world. Every horseman that rides forth in terrible but restrained judgment is a messenger of clemency from the king saying, repent, repent. 
or you too will perish. Overcome, or you will be judged. Worship the lamb or you'll face his wrath. It's mercy. Last, recognize and rest in the fact that all things are under God's sovereign control. The riders ride forth under whose authority? God's, who calls for the horsemen? It's all set in motion by Jesus breaking the seals that are on the scroll that belongs to God. Not one calamity can happen outside God's purposes and plan. The catastrophes that that issue forth from the scroll issue forth from God's scroll. Three of the four horsemen are explicitly given their power to enact the various judgments, and who gives it to them? God does. The, The picture of destruction and judgment here is not a picture of God vacating his throne. It's precisely the opposite. It's a picture of God reigning from his throne and granting authority for conquest, bloodshed, and judgment. Now, chapter six and chapter five go together. You gotta have the two together. Read the two together. Chapter six answers the question that's raised by chapter five. Because if you just read chapter five with all the singing and all the praising and, and God and the lamb on the throne, If that's all you read, you're left with a question. If God and the Lamb are reigning on the throne, why does the world stink? Why is there so much violence and suffering in the world? And the answer is given in chapter six. It's part of God's plan and purposes. And if you read just chapter six, with all its catastrophes, without chapter five, you would ask, where is God in this God-forsaken, hellish world? And so you need chapter five. Where is he? He's reigning from his throne, sovereignly reigning, receiving worship from the elders and the four living creatures, unending praise and glory. I can't do better in putting this together than Dennis Johnson, the pastor who put it this way to his congregation. As Christians see societies crumble and collapse, our response should not be terrified alarm as though our security were bound up with a fragile human network of law and order, but anticipation and confidence. The lamb is now on the throne with God's plan for history firmly in hand. When we see societies crumble and collapse, Christian, your response better not be terrified alarm, but anticipation and confidence. As you watch the four horsemen ride forth, we see warfare, we see civil strife, economic breakdown, sickness and death. Do you get stressed out? You become fearful? Or do you react with anticipation and confidence? We should take comfort in God's all-controlling sovereignty. That in a world of apparent chaos and destruction, nothing happens by chance. Nothing happens without divine purpose. Amen? Let's pray. Sovereign Lord, for a very, very, very long time, it was only you who existed. Trillions and trillions and trillions of years and many, many, many more before that, it was just you. You are ultimate reality. Our existence, our sheer existence, is by pure grace. And therefore, our existence is for a purpose to honor the one who is ultimate to worship the one who is ultimate, to live for the one who is ultimate, because everything we are and have originates from you. 
as believers bring us back to this when we walk through the hard times that this passage describes? Help us remember the mercy and grace you've extended us so in the darkest valley we will be sure to praise you still. What we are experiencing today are birth pains under your sovereign control leading to a glorious end. Tether our hopes to your unthwartable plans and purposes. For your glory, we pray these things. Amen.